Okay, I think we should we can go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome today uh, today's uh, speaker, Victor Corchis, who's currently the Arts and Science Distinguished Professor in the Department of Biology at Emory University. Uh, Victor actually grew up in a small community in the north coast of Spain in a region called Asturias. Uh, all, those, all those communities quite isolated. I just learned last night that uh, Severo Ochoa, the 59 Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine, also came from the same community. So apparently there's something in the water that fosters intellectual development. Victor was recognized as a bright student uh, with his, by his teachers and was introduced to biologists at the University of Madrid where he matriculated both for his undergraduate degree in chemistry and his PhD in biochemistry. He then pursued postdoctoral work with Matt Messelson at Harvard where he studied regulation and heat shock, see heat shock genes. He joined the Department of Biology at Johns Hopkins as assistant professor and eventually became chairman of that department in 1998. In the late 80s and 90s, Victor pursued a series of studies which characterized mechanisms by which a special class of genetic elements called chromatin insulators alter gene expression. These insulator elements have two important properties. They buffer genes from chromosomal position effects, and they interfere with enhancer-promoter interactions when they're inserted between these elements. This groundbreaking work defined a general mechanism by which genetic information is organized into insulated blocks of expression and also enlarged on the concept of action at a distance by enhancer elements. Subsequent work in Victor's lab led to the identification of proteins that function at these elements, and he also showed that they can come together at specific nuclear locations called insulator bodies. Thus, different regions of the genome can be organized into distinct domains that are independently regulated. Now, recently, Dr. Corchius has begun to probe the structure of Drosophila chromosomes, chromatin, at higher resolution using the rapidly evolving technology of chromosome confirmation capture, and I think his talk today will focus on some of that work. So uh, before we, uh, Victor begins, I'd like to mention there will be a uh, reception right over here in the library immediately after his talk. So those of you who would like to discuss his work in more detail, please come to the reception. So please join me in welcoming Victor to NIH. I look forward to his presentation. Thank you, Gordon. Um, so as uh, Gordon has alluded to, I would like to discuss um, the issue of how uh, chromat the way the chromatin fiber is organized in the nucleus, how that affects gene expression. So most of the time we are thinking about, uh, we are um, used to thinking about epigenetic information in terms of modifications that happen to the uh, 10 nanometer fiber of the chromatin. So we are used to thinking about how um, um, covalent histone modifications, for example, or methylation of the DNA, how that is transmitted from one cell generation to the other, or even from one organismal generation to the other one in some cases, and, and how those modifications to the, prime, to the 10 nanometer fiber of the chromatin, how that carries epigenetic information. And only more recently, um, we've developed the tools necessary, or other people have developed the tools necessary, to ask the questions of how is chromatin arranged in the nucleus at levels above the 10 nanometer fiber, and how that affects gene expression, and ask the question of whether that also carries epigenetic information. So in particular, um, we are interested in what happens at this level, and I don't know, this part of the slide is darker, I don't know if you can uh, really see it or not, but the chromosomes in the nucleus are um, contained within chromosome territories, and then the chromatin fiber is arranged in a certain way, in, in, in something that if you were able to see this slide, 
you would think that is a, a plate of spaghetti. And, and the question is, are those spaghetti arranged in a random form, or are they arranged in a very specific form that maybe is cell type specific, it changes during um, cell differentiation, and it carries epigenetic information because it allows the expression of a certain program of transcription, and then that can be maintained as the after the cell differentiates and as the cells um, form tissues. So what is the evidence that the chromosomes or the, or the chromatin uh, fiber is arranged in, in, in certain way? And there are many examples, but I want to show you one, which is um, the polyton chromosomes of Drosophila. And um, I'm showing it to you because I think it's a good example, but also this slide has a um, special sentimental um, um, meaning for me because this is the only slide that um, I contributed from the whole talk. So <laughs> this is actually a, a polythene chromosome squash that I did when I was um, a postdoc. Um, probably Carl will uh, help me do this. But also, those of you who are experts in this would recognize that this is the best polythene chromosome that you've ever seen spread, that you've ever seen in your life. So um, what you can see is that so the, the, the chromosome is stained with um, Kimsa or some, some, something that stains DNA. And you can see that there are regions that are, that are stained darkly and regions that don't. And so the darkly stained regions, they probably have more DNA. And the li lightly stained regions, they have less DNA. So there seems to be an alternating pattern of, uh, of condensed and decondensed chromatin in the polythene chromosomes. And the, the polythene chromosome, each of these chromosomes is really 2,000 chromosomes perfectly paired with each other. So is, we, we tend to look at this, I think, and just think about it as something normal instead of wondering about the, the beauty of what a polythene chromosome is and what it's telling us. So uh, uh, later in my talk, I'm, I'm going to come back to this arrangement and, and to, to, to sort of uh, suggest that in diploid cells, the chromosomes are also organized in this way. So to do that, I have to. Um, um, give you a few background um, pieces of data. So the, the, the first piece of data that I want you to um, remember is the idea that chromatin in Drosophila is, has five different colors. And this is work that was done in um, Van Stimsel's lab. And what he did was to map the genome localization of uh, 53 different Drosophila proteins. And then uh, do k-means clustering to, to, to try to find similarities. And he came up with five different clusters that he called green, yellow, red, blue, and black. And those different types of chromatin, which I will talk about continuously in my talk, have several characteristics. So green is a protein that has HP1. In addition, it has SUBAR39, which is a histone methyl transferase and it has H3K9 uh, methyl 2. Those are the characteristics of green chromatin. In green chromatin, genes located in that type of chromatin are expressed, but at low levels. You can see that there are some genes that are not expressed, but there are many genes that are expressed, but at low levels. Now, yellow and red chromatin are slightly different in the type of proteins that you can find there. But in terms of the typical histone met, um, modifications that we are thinking about, um, uh, that, that, that we are used to thinking about, H3K4 trimethyl, which is something that we would associate always with active chromatin, characterizes yellow and, and red chromatin. And, and therefore, we expect that genes in this chromatin would be transcribed. And you can see genes are transcribed, but there are also genes in yellow and red chromatin that are not transcribed. So not everything that is in red or yellow chromatin is transcribed. Then blue chromatin is the typical chromatin associated with polycom, is repressed chromatin, it has H3K27 trimethyl, and genes in, in blue chromatin are in general not transcribed, very little if any. 
And the same is true with black chromatin. Black chromatin is also a repressive type of, type of chromatin. It encompasses almost half of the whole drosophila genome is in, 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 in black chromatin. And is also repressed. Genes are not transcribed. And it has a series of proteins, uh, some of them um, um, famous proteins like lamin and histone H1, but other ones that have only been studied in Drosophila, like D1, for example. It's a weird Drosophila protein that I'm not sure that it has a homologin in vertebrates. So these are um, five different types of chromatin in Drosophila cells. So the, 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 one of the questions that I'm really addressing is how the epigenetic structure of chromatin in terms of modifications in the 10 nanometer fiber, how that relates to gene expression in the context of the three-dimensional architecture of the um, nucleus. And to address that question, I'm going to be talking about insulators. So insulators are proteins that were discovered uh, in, in the 80s, as, as, um, as uh, you've heard. And in vertebrates, the, the um, best characterized um, insulator is the CTCF insulator, which um, was born here at NIH, actually. And um, Gary Felsenfels group is uh, responsible for most um, work that has shed light on, on what this insulator does and how it does it and, um, and, and the role in the cell. Um, another insulator that is now being studied in vertebrates is um, the one defined by this protein TF3C. And actually, TF, um, this insulator was actually also discovered here at NIH by uh, Shiv Krewal. So this is what the, the, this is the view of vertebrate insulators. Now, in Drosophila, um, there is a CTCF protein also. Um, and the CTCF protein in Drosophila was first characterized by Viktor Lovanenkov, also here at NIH. So you, you can see that NIH is the, the birthplace of insulators. Um, they only insulate DNA. Otherwise, if they insulated other things, um, you know, you probably didn't need a fence. You didn't need all kinds of things. But <laughs> they only insulate DNA. So CTCF is the Drosophila homolog of, Drosoph of the CTCF protein. And then we have a whole bunch of other proteins that have weird names, um, typical Drosophila names. So suppressor of hairy wing is um, one of the insulators. Beef is another one. Gaga is another one. And, and what you see that these insulators have in common is the proteins that they interact with. So all these DNA binding proteins are really a way for the cell to bring to different regions of the genome certain common proteins. One is called CP190, and another one is called modifier of MDG4. So that's the view of insulators in Drosophila. And if you were to look at the genome, you would see the, the distribution of these proteins would look something like this. So you see these are genes, so this gives you an idea of how the, the genes are organized in the Drosophila genome. They are much, a tile, they are very tightly packed, much more so than in vertebrates. And then insulator uh, proteins are present throughout. And um, when you first look at a map like this, at least when we first look at it, um, it it's hard to see um, a significance to it. And we are trying to put some order into this. But for the purpose of this, this talk, what, what I should tell you is that probably the insulators that are really working in the genome are these sites that have all the proteins together. So you can see, for example, here, CTCF, suppressive heroin, beef, and CP190 are all together. So this is probably a real insulator. This one is an insulator wait, waiting for some other companion to make it active. And so, in, in a given cell, some insulators are active or not active depending on the proteins that are present at the site, and there must be a, a way of regulating insulator activity that is based on recruiting some of those proteins to the appropriate site. And I'll come back to that question, to that issue, um, towards the end of the talk. 
So again, we have um, um, chromatin modifications, uh, proteins in the chromatin that define types of chromatin. We have insulated proteins that, um, in, in, I'm not telling you about it, but, I, but I'm not describing it, but people have demonstrated in different uh, experimental systems that they can mediate inter and intrachromosomal interactions. So the question is how do they all come together and what they are doing? So to address that question, we are using high c it's a, it's a method developed by Jobdecker um, that allows you to interrogate all the interactions that take place in the genome. So I'm going to go a little slowly through the technique and, and the challenges so that you understand the significance of the result. So in high c if you have two regions that are interacting, you digest the DNA with a specific uh, restriction enzyme. You, you have a situation like this, so, so you have to cross-link the DNA and the proteins first. Then you fill in the ends with uh, nucleotides um, that have biotin. You ligate the, the DNA again. You uh, um, undo the cross-link and you sonicate and you then isolate the, specifically the fragments that um, have the biotin with a streptavidin column and then you can do deep sequencing of, um, of, of, of the, um, the fragments. And so what you get is a very large collection of um, sequences, of pair sequences. So we've done this, in, in, we've done biological replicates and technical replicates. There's a high correlation between the data um, and we ended up with 82 million pair reads after we've removed all the things that were bad according to the, um, to the statistical people that, uh, the, the statistics people that help us analyze this data. So um, what do you do with 82 million reads? So to, to put this into context, um, if you're familiar with the paper that Job Decker published on the um, three-dimensional architecture of human chromosomes in human cells, um, I, I believe that in, th in that case, he analyzed around 9 million reads. The, hu the human genome is 20-fold bigger than Drosophila's, and the resolution that they could reach in that case uh, was around 1 megabase. In our case, with, with the Drosophila genome and this number of reads, we can reach a resolution of a single fragment within a specific two megabase region. So we have single fragment resolution. So what do we see and does, does what we see make sense? So this is a contact matrix of the, the interactions along all the chromosomes. So I'm showing you this picture, first, first of all to show you that there are these regions of interactions that form these uh, modules, like squares, um, and I'm going to come back to this over and over. Um, um, and, and these modules flank the, the diagonal, and the diagonal just means inter is where interactions of a fragment with itself is present. So we eliminate those, those reads. But the, um, the, what is interesting in this slide is that you can see this is the heterochromatin of chromosome 2, and it interacts um, with itself because this is the left arm and this is the right arm of chromosome 2. So you can see it, and it interacts with chromosome 3 and with chromosome X and with chromosome 4. And um, what this means is that the centromeres of the chromosomes are coming together. They are interacting with each other. And this is, is known to happen in Drosophila. It also happens in human cells, in, uh, more or less um, depending on the cell line. But um, if you remember the polythene chromosome that I showed you before, all the chromosomes were interacting in the chromocenter. So in a diploid cell, the chromosomes are also interacting together. The other thing that you see is there are very few, um, there, there are some interactions, and you'll see more when I focus on the specific chromosomes, but chromosome 2L doesn't interact with chromosome 2R more than it, it interacts with 3L or 3R. And so what that means is that the chromosomes in this specific cell line, they are not in a rubble configuration. So it's not like the two arms of the, the centromeres at one end of the nucleus and the telomeres at the other, at the other end. The chromosomes are organized in a different way. 
So in order to an analyze the, the data, <coughs> we did the following. So this is a region of the genome in which we've mapped 500 fragments. So this is around 200 megabases. I'm, I'm sorry for going into the technical details, but it's important in order for you to understand the, um, if, if, if what I'm telling you is true or not. So ag again, you see these regions of high interactions and then other regions of lower interactions that sort of overlap with the regions of low interactions. So if we take all the reads and we look at the frequency of interaction with respect to the distance, and we measure the distance not in KB but in fragment numbers, the blue line here is the average of all the genome. Now, if we consider just this um, modules, I'm going to call them chromosome modules from, from now on, you see that the interaction decreases slowly and then there is a point where it decreases very fast and then it decreases slowly again. This point where the interaction goes down is the region in between two modules and we'll call that interchromosomal module, inter, intermodule region. So what we've done is sort of measure uh, 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 calculate a modularity index that, that is, is a way of calculating this, essentially. And then arbitrarily, we, decide that we cut off, uh, we, we made a cut off at 0.6. So anything that has more than 0.6 modularity index is a module, one of these, and anything that has less than that is an intermodule, something like that, okay? So if you, if you think about the way this region of the chromosome is organized, you have an intermodule region that is like a line, and then a module in the, in where the chromatin is more condensed, and then another intermodule region, and then another module where the chromatin is more condensed. Now remember, the reason why it's condensed is because of these interactions. And these interactions, in these interactions, we've eliminated all short-range interactions. So probably we are not taking into account things like the 30 nanometer fiber. These interactions are not taking into account interactions that would ha ha happen as a consequence of um, the chromatin being in the form of 30 nanometer fiber. So when, when we um, um, calculate this modularity index, then, for example, here, we would, we would call this region an intermodule, and it corresponds to this in the heat map. This is another intermodule. This is a module. So by doing this through the genome, we can subdivide the genome into modules and intermodules. And if you look at the colors of the chromatin, these are the colors of the chromatin that I mentioned before, you can see that in general, there's a pretty good correlation between a module and the type of chromatin that is in it. So for example, in this module is all repressive chromatin, either black or blue. In this module here is either yellow or red, so it's all active, the same here. So there's not a perfect correlation, but there is a pretty good correlation between the definition of a module and the fact that that module has one type of chromatin as defined by epigenetic modifications. So this gives you sort of a genome-wide view of this, of what I just said. So the average, the genome average for the different types of chromatin is that half of the genome is black and then a big chunk of it is, is blue. So a lot of the genome is repressed and then a third of the genome is active. When we look at these chromosome modules, in, in, within chromosome modules, the distribution is more or less the same. And when we look at the number of modules in the different regions, we see something that is not very different. So what this tells us is that there are a lot of chromosome modules, a third of all of them have black chromatin repressive, a, a, a six of them have um, blue chromatin, polycom chromatin, and then another third I probably didn't get all my thirds right, um, all has active chromatin, okay? So that's the distribution of chromatin within the modules. The module size on average is around 
um, is not really influenced by the chromatin, so that these are the different colors of chromatin. It's around, somewhere around 50 to 100 kilobases, but there are modules that are up to 500 kilobases long, okay? And um, when we look at the gene density in the module regions, they have, on average, and this is also independent of the type of chromatin, an average of one gene per 10 kb. When we look at the transcription rate of genes in modules, we see that there are repressed genes in all of them, and there are active genes in all of them, and it doesn't depend on the epigenetic type of chromatin. So let me see, say uh, this again, because this is the only important thing of my talk. After this, you can leave. We have a region, regions in the, in the genome that form these things that we call modules. These regions have um, um, a higher level of interactions compared to neighboring regions. I hes hesitate to say condensed chromatin. They are just interacting more frequently. These regions are not very rich in genes, but the genes that are present in the, and the, the genes that are present in these regions are transcribed or not transcribed independent of the type of histone modifications or the type of chromatin that they have. So this, these regions are transcribed more or less whether they have H3K4 trimethylation or H3K27 trimethylation. So, so what I am trying to argue is that what is important for the transcription is, is the fact that they are in a module. Now, what happens to the intermodule regions? The intermodule regions also are more or less, the type of chromatin is more or less distributed the same. A third of it is black and a third of it is um, green or red, so there's not that difference in the type of chromatin between the intermodules and modules. And the number of them is more or less the same as the modules. The size is much smaller. The average size of these intermodule regions is 20 kilobases, so they are much smaller than the modules. They are slightly, they have more genes. They have around two genes per 10 kb. So the gene density in these regions is higher, and they are transcribed more. And they are transcribed more. In, in this case, the type of chromatin has an effect. So for example, in black chromatin, there are more genes that are completely repressed than in red or yellow chromosome uh, chromatin. But again, the transcription, if you remember from before, the transcription level of genes in intermodules is higher than in modules, even for the same type of chromatin. So again, the intermodule regions are regions that don't have interactions. So you could call this a more open chromatin. And what is determining the transcription level is not the type of chromatin, is the fact that they are in intermodules. Now, what do we find in these different regions? What kind of proteins do we find that are interesting? So the intermodule regions are depleted for proteins of black chromatin, uh, blue chromatin, and green chromatin, and they ha are, have an overrepresentation of insulator proteins, okay? And the insulator proteins, um, were partially used, but not really used to define these uh, types of chromatin. Um, so if we look at the other proteins, they are specific for certain types of chromatin. So for example, the polycom members are specific for blue chromatin. HP1, SUBAR39 are specific for green chromatin. But insulator proteins don't care on the type of chromatin. They are present in all types of chromatin but they are preferentially present at intermodules. Okay, so let's look at these modules and intermodules in a little more detail. So we've used um, a program or an algorithm that 
um, uh, we've been collaborating with Jun Liu and Ming Hu at Harvard, and they've developed something that they call Bayesian 3D construct constructor for high seed data, um, and they call Bach. So this program is able to take all these interactions and, and, and reconstruct a three-dimensional model of the chromatin based on the frequency of the interactions so that we can sort of look at a picture of, of the heat map, okay? So here we have a region that is um, 80 um, um, kilobases, and it has a small module here, a small module here, a bigger, uh, two modules here, and then um, um, several intermodule regions. If we take into account all these interactions and we try to represent a three-dimensional model of what that would look like based on these interactions, this is what it looks like. This is at least what this algorithm tells us that it looks like. So you can see that the chromatin is folding but it's not compacted in the way we are used to thinking about compacted chromatin. If now we um, zoom out and we look at a bigger region, now we see something like this. So this region is now located in, in here. So as we zoom out, because we don't have enough reads, we lose resolution. So although here we have single fragment resolution, in these other pictures, we don't have single fragment resolution. So we lose resolution. We are not able to see the detail, but we know that this is represented by this. If we go even farther out, this is half of the chromosome. Again, you can see this whole region here is, is represented by this kink here, and you can see how this half of the chromosome is folded in the 3D space. Now, <coughs> <clears throat> An important point here is that this region that is 80 kilobases is just contained in here. And you see in this region of the chromosome we have this module, another one, another one, and then there is an overarching module that covers them all. Okay? So this structure that we call a large module, large chromosome, mo chromosome module, must form by interactions in between sequences within it, which means sequences be between the individual modules that I mentioned before. And as you zoom out to a larger pl place in the chromosome, this whole region is now in here, and you can see that this region is now within a bigger module. So the chromosome is organized in this hierarchical structure in which if we start from the whole chromosome, has modules and intermodules, but if we go and look in one of those modules, there are small, smaller modules and intermodules, and if we look in each of them, there's even a smaller ones. I'm not sure whether um, I'm making myself clear with this statement because I don't have a picture, but maybe you can visualize that in, in, in your head. So um, these large chromosome um, modules and intermodules, they have similar properties and I won't go through them because they are not important. So I told you that the large modules and intermodules arise from interactions among the small ones. So in this picture you can um, see what, what I mean. So in this picture we have um, a small module, another one here, and another one here. And so here and here we can see interactions that are happening between this intermodule region and this intermodule region. So what falls the chromosome to form the large modules is interactions between the intermodules at a lower level. And really what they are is interactions between the borders of the modules, although you can appreciate it here the interactions are between the borders of the module. So again, to illustrate this again, this region falls in something like this. So this big module in here is this region here in the middle. So you can get an idea of how it's folding. So although a module is more compacted, it's not compacted as, as um, compacted as the 30 nanometer fiber, for example. So what is 
at these interaction sites, these interaction sites that I just told you about, these, these sites that are located at the borders between modules and intermodules and are interacting with each other to fold the chromosome into higher levels of organization. What is there? So when we examine this genome-wide, you can see this is a, a, a met, metamodule and um, these are insulated proteins, the only protein that we see a correlation between the interaction sites and um, the, the protein type is insulated proteins. So you can see insulated proteins are through the region, but at these boundaries that are interacting with each other are more enriched. The other thing that is more enriched right there at these boundaries, at these interaction boundaries, is highly expressed genes, okay? So highly expressed genes means RNA polymerase um, in principle and a lot of other different things. So in, in this analysis, we cannot, we can only establish correlations. We cannot decide on cause and effect. So I'm uh, quickly going to flip through some slides to, to show you what this looks like. So what I'm going to show you now is a subset of interactions that are what we call the long range interactions. So they are the interactions between these module, intermodule boundaries that are folding the chromosome. They are not the interactions within the small modules, okay? And the pictures that I'll show you are for chromosome 2R. So these are all the interactions at the single fragment level of resolution that we can see in chromosome 2R. So you can see that there are many interactions, that there's a huge mess, and that it's going to take a long time to figure out what they are. Now, uh, if we try to break them into, into categories, these are the interactions mediated by insulated proteins. So in these diagrams, these are the different types of chromatin in the, in, with the different colors. These are the locations of the different insulated proteins. I don't remember, but they are beef, suppressive heroin, CTCF, and CP190. And then these are um, the interactions. And if you were to come up here close to the screen and look at these interactions, you would see that the interacting sites are located where the proteins are together in the chromosomes. And if they are not located um, together, then there's no interaction. This is what I mentioned at the beginning. If we look at the sizes of these loops that are formed, insulators tend to form loops. They don't really care the, uh, about the size. They, they tend to, to, to form loops that go from 50 kb all the way to four megabases. Um, so they can form relatively short interactions up to four megabases. Um, these are the interactions that are mediated by polycom. Um, these are the types of chromatin, and if you look carefully, all the interactions are mediated by green chromatin. This is the location of uh, several polycom group proteins. And um, the polycom, interestingly, the interactions cluster into two different sizes. One is around one megabase, the other one is around three megabases. And, and we think that what that means is that some of the interactions are local and bring together one or two um, polycom uh, type domains, and the other interactions are long range and are bringing together f um, polycom domains that are far apart and form these uh, polycom bodies. HP1. Um, forms a very defined subset of interactions. You can see that HP1 is predominant, interactions are predominantly lo located in, in this green chromatin that um, is the pericentric heterochromatin in, in, in chromosome 2R. And then um, form a few loops with green chromatin uh, where HP1 is present through the um, euchromatin and most of the interactions are uh, um, a, a definite side of um, around, um, I think the scale must be wrong, around 500 kb according to this. Um, and finally, these are interactions, um, not finally, but um, mediated by lamin. You, you can see, for example, green chromatin is devoid of lamin. There are no interactions. This, this is not present in the, in the lamin. And um, these are the lamin-associated regions that Van Stinsel has mapped, and if you look, you can see that most of the interactions are really not mediated by 
the actual region by the actual lamina associated domain, but they, they are mediated by the boundaries, the, the borders of that domain. And the, the, some, the peaks cluster into small and large peaks, again, just like polycom. And um, this is what RNA polymerase does. These are interactions that are mediated by RNA polymerase. Um, they are most located in, in yellow or red chromatin, Some, many of them in, in also in green chromatin, suggesting that this chromatin is also uh, transcribed. Uh, the size, they tend not to care, and actually a lot of them coincide with insulated proteins. So there is an overlap between loops mediated by RNA polymerase and loops mediated by insulated proteins. And if you want to speculate, you, you, you may conclude from this that maybe one of the things that insulators are doing is bringing transcribed genes to certain, um, to, to, together in a region of the nucleus that could be um, uh, a transcription factory. Um, so <clears throat> I am going to um, skip some of this information. Um, because I, I have already told you. So let me tell you, um, um, I think, a cute result. Are you guys still with me? I didn't bore you completely. So um, many of you are, are probably familiar with the fact that um, Drosophila chromosomes in interface, um, the two homologs are paired. Um, this doesn't happen in, in human cells, for example. Um, so this is the basis of a phenomenon called transvection. So we wonder whether we could actually see this in the high C data. So the, the chromosomes may pair because either there are specific regions that are pairing, and that causes the chromosome to pair, or, or there are large regions, or there is a combination, or the whole arm is paired. But in the process of analyzing the high C results, um, we saw a lot of fragments in which, a, a lot of ligation events in which um, if we call this direction forward and this direction forward, we saw ligations in which we had a forward ligated to a forward. And without going into a, a, a lot of detail in, in, in why, how you can explain this, you can only explain it if these ligation events come from the two homologs being paired. So if, for example, if you go back to the high C data that Job Decker published in human cells, you do not see that. So it could be that we did something weird when we constructed the library, or actually it could be that these are um, telling us that those are regions of the, the homologous chromosomes where the pairing is taking place. Um, so we analyze these pairing sites. They are very short. They are just a few kilobases in length. They have all kinds of chromatin and all kinds of gene activity, and they are enriched. They are devoid of um, um, lamin and polycom, and they are enriched um, for every other protein. So we don't specifically see uh, insulated proteins in, in them. They are located, again, at the borders between uh, modules and intermodules. Not specifically at intermodules or modules, but at the boundary. And I told you that those were also the boundaries that, uh, and, and there are a few only per chromosome. It's, it's a very sparse number of sites that, that are keeping the two homologs together. Um, and they must be the same type of, inter or a subset of the interactions that are um, uh, causing the interactions within the chromosome. They are all re also responsible for keeping the two homologs together. So in, in the last few minutes, um, I want to go um, into um, the idea that this structure that I just described can be alter in a way that can be regulated. So what I've told you is that the chromosome is organized into modules and intermodules in a hierarchic, hierarchical fashion. And that the genes that are in intermodules are transcribed at high levels. So 
the obvious question is to ask, how does that change from cell type to, to cell type? How does it change um, during differentiation? What would it look like? What do the chromosomes look like in a stem cell? And then if you induce the stem cell to differentiate, how does that change? Is it different in one cell type versus the other? Or is it just a, a, a structure that is common to all the cells and really what is controlling gene expression is not this structure but the epigenetic modifications. But I hope that, that the arguments that I made convince you that that's not the case and that this three-dimensional organization is superimposing another level of regulation on the epigenetic modifications of the, of the 10 nanometer fiber. So what we are try, trying to do is trying to see if this organization is different between different cell types. I also told you that the interactions responsible for creating this organization appear to be mediated in large part by insulated proteins. So if we look at the distribution of insulated proteins in different cell types, we see that at least in Drosophila, th there is some differences. And there's also differences in vertebrates, and it's just a a an issue of whether um, um, you believe that the differences are real or they are a consequence of just noise in, in the chip, chip or chip seek experiments. But we can, in Drosophila, we know that we can regulate insulator activity either by changing the recruitment of the DNA binding protein or changing the recruitment of this protein called CP190 that binds to the DNA binding protein. So we know that we can find differences between different cell types in that type of, 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 of arrangement. So how can we regulate these interactions? So we've been looking at one specific modification, um, and that is parilation. And very quickly, I'm, I'm going to tell you, without pointing too much to the data, I'm going to tell you that um, in vitro and in vivo, both CTCF and CP190 can be parilated, and that, um, so this is in vivo, and that that parilation event affects the ability of these proteins to interact. So, um, I, I think I have that in a, in a slide later on. So the ability of CP190 and CTCF to interact is regulated by parilation. And this affects insulator activity. And we measure insulator activity by an arcane um, method that involves looking at phenotypes of flies. So this is a gene with a promoter and an enhancer. Normally, the gene is expressed and makes the black color of the abdomen. If we have an insulator between the enhancer and the promoter, then the gene is mutant. So if we mutate PARP, and this is something, if we mutate PARP, which is the enzyme that parilates, um, then the flies die. And so we can look at anything. And so what we do is have, look at the effect of just heterozygous mutation. And I don't know if you can see it, but the, by mutating PARP, the insulator cannot work, and then the body color of the fly is black. So in vivo, uh, lack of parilation affects insulator activity. This is another insulator that is controlled by CTCF. If we mutate PARP, then the eyes turn red. That means that the insulator is not working so well. So this is the slide that shows you that if we inhibit parilation, then the uh, CP190, uh, CTCF cannot interact with CP190, okay? So, so all this sort of suggests that parilation is regulating insulin activity by regulating the interactions between these two proteins. And we know that the interactions between the two proteins are important for insulator function. So if we look at the genomic distribution of these of this proteins, then you would assume that if we um, inhibit parilation in cells by treating with a, a drug that is called 3AB, then the, the localization, the genome-wide distribution of these proteins will change. And that is true, 
um, many sites, actually most of the sites, are not affected, but there is a subset of sites that are um, dramatically reduced or completely gone when we inhibit parallelation. Um, so this is the, the, the number of sites that change versus the, um, all the changes. So th there are two additional tests that we can do to um, really study whether this is affecting insulator activity or not. So the other test of insulator activity is the, the ability of the proteins to make a loop. And um, one of the ways we look at that is by looking in cells. So in cells, in normal cells, if we look at the distribution of insulator proteins, they tend to be in the periphery of the nucleus next to lamin, and they form these uh, blobs of stuff th that we call insulator bodies. And although we've never demonstrated specifically this, um, we think that these insulator bodies are places where the different insulator proteins are coming together and interacting in a specific region of the nucleus. If now we treat the, the cells with this inhibitor of parallelation, you can see that the insulator proteins are still there, but now they are diffused through the nucleus. So on, basis, on the basis of this criterion, it looks like inhibition of parallelation affects the ability of the proteins to interact, the insulator proteins, which are bound to certain regions of the nucleus to interact with each other. So, so the other um, thing that we've done is done 4C. So you, we've used one of these sites that, um, in, in which um, inhibition of parallelation affects the recruitment of CP190 as a bait, and we've studied interactions by 4C with, with other regions of the genome, and then we've gone specifically to those regions and the, uh, quantitative, uh, quantitative the interaction by 3C, and you can see that those regions that interact with this bait in which CP190 decreases upon parallelation, those regions, uh, in those regions, the interaction between the bait and other regions through the genome goes down, okay? So parallelation affects the interactions between the insulator proteins that are necessary to form a loop um, this would be an active insulator that is forming a loop. This is an inactive insulator that is unable to form a loop. Parallelation is required for this interaction. And if you inhibit parallelation at a subset of sites of, in the genome, there is uh, a, a decrease of interactions and also a, a, an impairment of insulator function in vivo as judged by the phenotype of the flies that I told you. So I'm going to address one more question, and that is what happens to the three-dimensional architecture of the nucleus during the cell cycle? And this is a question for which I don't have an answer. I'm just going to give you some very pre preliminary results of the things that we are doing in the last three or four minutes. So when we look at the different insulator proteins to see what happens during the cell cycle, during, during uh, mitosis in metaphase chromosome, the, the architecture of the chromosome changes dramatically. And so if insulator proteins are regulating this architecture, then something, they, they must be changing, and they must be rearranging, and they must be doing things to allow the transition from interface chromatin structure to mitotic chromatin structure. So if we look at the distribution of these proteins, we see that in mitosis, CP190 uh, tends to um, disappears from the chromosomes and, and is located in the periphery of the, of the mitotic plate, the periphery of the chromosomes. And I don't know if you can appreciate it here, but uh, CTCF does the same thing, whereas suppressive hair wing or modifier, they just get diffused through the nucleus. They don't follow the same pattern. So we look at the distribution of these proteins by ChIP-seq, comparing interface localization with um, localization in, in metaphase chromosomes. Um, in Drosophila, it's almost impossible to synchronize cells, so, so what we have to do was just take a, a population of growing cells and uh, sort them um, to specifically isolate the population of mitotic cells. And what you can see 
uh, here, which you don't have to examine in detail, and I'll just tell you, is that some of the proteins change dramatically uh, during mitosis. So suppressor free wind, there is only, uh, th there are um, um, a thousand peaks, but those peaks are almost undetectable. Um, Um, and I had a slide to show you that. So, so what happens is that suppressive wind essentially le leaves the chromosomes, and CTCF and CP190 has they, they have a very a, a large number of new sites in mitosis. They are specific for mitosis. They were not there in interface. If they are mediating interactions, this tells us that in the reorganization of the chromosomes between interface and mitosis. Um, that maybe that reorganization of the chromosome is mediated by insulated proteins. And if we look to see where those new sites are when we compare um, uh, interface with mitosis, what we see is that the new sites are present in highly transcribed genes. Okay? So there's been, there, there, there was a, um, a manuscript from John Sedat's lab recently that showed very nicely that. Uh, components, uh, the MSL3 protein, which is a protein that is a component of the dosage compensation pathway in Drosophila, that that protein is, stays associated with chromosomes in mitosis and that is present on the surface of the metaphase chromosomes. And the idea is that that protein is there to keep those genes that need to be highly expressed or expressed immediately after G1 M, uh, the MG1 transition um, to keep those genes in a special arrangement on the metaphase chromosome. So we've looked at the distribution, compared the distribution of the MSL proteins with CP190 or with CTCF, and what we see is that during mitosis, these two proteins actually co-localize with MSL2, for example. So Although these results are preliminary, it suggests to us that, that insulated proteins maybe are involved in um, creating certain um, arrangement of the mitotic chromosomes to make sure that either those genes are active, to, so, so that genes are, stay on the surface of the chromosome, and those genes are activated quickly, so they are bookmarked for rapid activation or um, and another form of regulation just because the insulated proteins, the new sites, they seem to be associated with highly uh, transcribed genes. So that insulated proteins would regulate a transition that goes from interface forming structures like this to mitosis in which th this is the mitotic chromosome. They are kept on the surface to, to maintain certain genes in, 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 in um, more open um, conformation. So I'm going to finish here. I just want to leave you with a few take-home messages. <clears throat> um, one is that we believe, and we are getting um, more evidence every day, that the genome is organized in this complex hierarchical, hierarchical three-dimensional structure that is made out of these modules and intermodules. And I think this is a, a going to be, so I never made the connection to the polythene chromosome but we are trying very hard to see if the modules in interface chromosome are the bands, the dark regions in polythene chromosomes, and the intermodules are the interbands. Um, and, and this structure carries epigenetic information, may carry epigenetic information. We don't have evidence for that. That may be cell type specific, but we do uh, think, based on the results that we have until now, that, that the structure, the module versus intermodule structure, carries a, another level of regulation that is superimposed on, on the primary uh, epigenetic modifications in the 10 nanometer fiber. Now, an important point that I didn't address is that may, some of these interactions may be causal and some of them may just be an effect. So I, I think you know, there's a, 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 a very different view of the structure of the chromosome if you think that there are some proteins that are there to create a structure that then allows a, a certain functional output versus function in, in terms of transcription driving the structure. So those are two very opposite views of what is happening to the chromosome 
And I think probably the truth is somewhere in between. Um, and um, um, we would like to um, eventually show that, that this three-dimensional structure, and we will know this when we look at more cell types, is, is sort of a fingerprint of cell identity, so that different cells would have a different structure, but it's also a blueprint of what the um, functional output of the genome is. In other words, how the genome can be interpreted and transcribed. So let me just finish by acknowledging the people that did the work. All the high C experiments were done by Chun Hui, who's a very talented postdoc in my lab. Um, the the uh, parallelation story that I told you is the work of another postdoc, Chin Tong Ong, and the, um, the mitosis uh, staff is a graduate student named Beth Sang. So thank you very much. Take a few questions. If you'd like, please uh, address your question at the microphones. If those of you may. Yes. So uh, very nice, Victor. This, so the, this uh, this evidence of regulation. There's a fairly vast literature about PAR regulation, PAR itself. How how do you envision that kind of regulation working physiologically? Um. <laughs> um I haven't. Um, 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 thought about that. Uh, you mean what is regulating PARP? How is PARP targeted to specific sites? And, um, and, and under what physiologic conditions would such structures be physiologically relevant? Yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer to that, really. Uh, it's probably a very complicated answer um, in, in view of what we know about PARP in vertebrates and how it affects all kinds of things. Um, so I, I don't. I don't know yet. Uh, and, you know, uh, 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 until now, the, the one thing that has been bothering me most is how does PARP recognize some insulator sites but not others? How is it uh, deciding between that? And, and we don't have an answer, yeah? So um, I have a question regarding the, 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 the relationship, the physical relationship between the domains and interdomains and the transcriptional status of the block. So if you disrupt um, a histone modification by either using HDAC inhibitors or depleting uh, histone methyltransferases, does that also affect the domain structures now on, on the chromatin? No, I would say no. no um, you affect a histone modification globally or in a specific, globally in the whole genome? Yeah. Right. Um, would that, that would alter affect, the description of status of lots I of mean, genes, right? I would say some of these, dom some of these um, domains or interdomains, specifically the interdomains, a lot of the interactions are related to transcription and to RNA polymerase. We don't know if RNA polymerase is causal or is something else affect, uh, you know, really, um, um, that correlates with RNA polymerase. Um, I would say if you inhibit H3K4 trimethyl, I think you would affect the domains just because you would affect all kinds of interactions and you would affect the folding. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks. So, Victor, the, the green chromatin module that you showed, is that disrupted by mutations in HB1 proteins? I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think that that, that has been done, uh, has been addressed, yeah. But I think that, that would be an, an important um, thing to do, yes. Um, many of the Drosophila lines have an endogenous intracellular uh, endosymbiont, Wolbachia. And um, five, six years ago, they found that, this, that the entire genome is embedded in the Drosophila genome as well. Uh, so mapping this you know, subset of genes onto your modular, intermodular map well, could be very interesting since they, they clearly work together to modify this intracellular organism. So is the, the genome of this organism is, is integrated <laughs> into the Drosophila genome? Yes, it is, yeah. In and a lot of different places? Well, that's what I'm asking you. You see, I, <laughs> you, could, you could basically get a line and look at it, you can, right now, the genes are there and you've got them and you could map them onto your modular map 
and uh -huh. just see where they uh, end up. I mean, you know, those are th that's the information that we get rid of. Right. First. A lot of people get rid of the interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of information that we eliminated uh, right. here. For example, the nucleolus, the fact that uh, yeah. all the genes are repeated. That's the first thing that we get rid of. Well, because, um, because I mean, the endosymbiont has basically shed its genome because it doesn't need to have it like a car, you know, on smooth roads will get rid of its uh, spare tire. Mm -hmm. But um, you can uh, clearly, uh, because there are, you know, free living Wolbachia, you know exactly what the genes are. Mm -hmm. So you could go back to what you threw away, pull out the Wolbachia genes, and then map them onto. Uh, this would be fascinating. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. That, I think that's a good idea. Okay, uh, Victor has an airplane to, to catch, so I think we should close. Thanks, thanks again for a very interesting presentation. And remember the reception immediately adjacent here in the library. <laughs>